Love you, church. You're a great church. Let me give you the latest statistics as the end of May 1st of June when COVID broke loose. And this is dealing with uh, what we've used the term as Barna. Barna is uh, statisticians that I've used, George Barna, for the last 30 years. He studies churches, and this is what's happened. Out of the churches pre-COVID, in other words, before that, a third of the people have stuck in their home church. One third. Out of that one third, half of them are watching their pastor online. you imagine that? So if you had a church of, say, um, 240, 80 people are watching. Uh, 40 are coming to church and 40 are watching from home. The other a bunch, uh, 160, aren't even going. Follow where I'm going? The other third of the churches in America are now have started picking up on another pastor. They've been watching online and decided, hey, I want this guy to be my pastor. And they've gone to that route. And then the other third has quit church altogether. That's what's happened to the churches in America. So what I say, I say, God, you know what you're doing? You're shaking some things up. Amen. You, you move some. As a matter of fact, you've even given us people like me. Maybe not you, but people like me who decided that professional sports ain't worth watching anymore. I've decided, you know what? I think, I, I think God, I, I forgive me. I feel like I've kind of made a lot of this an idol. I, I just want to spend more time with you and get to know you. Now, I'm going to miss it. Don't, don't tell you me wrong. I love them. You know, I'm a fanatic about it. And I'm praying college sports to stay fine. That's my hope because, you know, I'm a Roll Tide fan. But if they don't, then the next thing you know, I'll be, I'll, I'll be uh, watching fishing on TV, I guess, or something like that. But it's just, it's just it's got too political. It's got too nonsensical. Um, the, the BLM, if you study it, their ideology is so far out of track. It's so messed up. You know, if, if they said anything other than BLM, I'd probably be for it. But I can't support that. Amen. You say, well, you're just a white racist. No, I'm not. Man, my black friends, I love them. I feel sorry for what, I, what they're having to endure right now. It's just, it's just a mess, man. It's a mess. And we just keep, and, and, you know, the more we're trying to fight racism, the more we're making racism. You know, and so we, we're, it's just that. But I, I'm so kingdom-minded. I want to stay kingdom-minded. I want to do, the, the scripture says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when I hear the word of God, faith rises inside of me. And I get more, and, and what can faith do? Faith moves mountains. Faith heals diseases. Faith brings in blessings in your life that you've never had. Faith will bless your spouse just because you've got faith. You'll bless somebody else around them. Your kids are dependent on your faith. Jesus looked at Peter and said, Peter, I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. Satan desires to sift you as wheat, but I prayed for you that your faith fail not. Faith is something you can't see, but it's believing for the impossible until it becomes possible. Faith looks out there and says, you know what? I'm going to take this right here. I'm going to believe for it, and I'm going to bring it in. Long before I ever owned a Harley Davidson, I had a Harley Davidson replica in my office. And I looked at that little thing, and I said, Lord, I know one day I'm going to get me one of these. I'll never forget the day that thing rolled into church. Hallelujah. My faith was answered. Amen. So faith Faith is a powerful thing. I, I believe that if you pray for something and believe God for it, and it lines up with the will of God, oftentimes it'll happen. And if it doesn't seem like it's lining up, watch this, with the will of God, I can worship it. I can worship Him until it lines up. I'll fix and prove that to you in just a minute. In other words, my worship affects Him. It does something to him. My sacrifice affects him. On Thursday, I started praying, God, you know what? I, I have no, no hurt toward anybody south of us in Texas, but we've been flooded enough up here. I've dealt with it enough, so I'm praying in the name of Jesus. You send that storm another direction. On Thursday, we didn't know where it was going. Amen. By Friday, that thing started heading away from us, and we've had a wonderful weekend. And again, I'm not pressing against anyone, but how many know somebody got to pray? Amen. Somebody got to say something. And I believe the last couple of times I didn't say enough. And I started believing. So my thought is, why don't we just ask? Everybody say, why don't we just ask? Amen. Why don't we just ask? We, you know, we get sick. We don't ask God. We need something. We don't ask God. We ask God. That's we don't ask God. He is my provider. He's Jehovah Jireh. So I need to ask God. So I'm learning to ask God. We're here 40 years into this. And it hits me like a revelation. Ask God. God. If you need something, just ask him. In Matthew chapter 5, and I'm not there. I'm going to go. I'm going to be with you in just a minute in Matthew chapter 7, okay? But in Matthew chapter 5, the scripture tells us that Jesus went on to a mountain. And on that mountain, he began to pray. Now, context, a lot of times, uh, watch this. Let's do this here, Sister Kim. Go quickly to Matthew chapter 8. 
Let me just read the, my opening verse here, and then we'll go back. Matthew chapter 8. You see it there? Click on that. Just kind of skip down past Matthew 7, then you hit Matthew 8. See it there? They're helping you. Amen. Matthew chapter 8, verse 1. He worshipped him. Uh, that's, that's not it. Never mind. I'll read it to you. And when he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Matthew 8, verse 1. When he came down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Now let's back up to the very beginning, Kim, and start all over. Matthew 5, Jesus goes up on top of the mountain. He's got a multitude with him. He teaches him the Beatitudes, blessed are us. And he starts walking through them. Last week I talked to you about blessed are the peacemakers, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, amen, which is very important. So the curious point of when I'm walking through this is I see that in chapter 6, he talked about prayer. He talked about fasting. He talked about giving. And, and when I get to, to Matthew uh, 6, he talks about to us, don't worry, seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. He talked about the rich. He talked about the poor. He talked about healthy. He talked about sick. The issue was, was the multitude. Everybody say the multitude. So the multitude was with him in Matthew 5, 6, 7, and 8. And they're listening. And they're hearing the word of God. And as Jesus, after sharing all of these tremendous truths, because he is the word of God, as he begins to talk to them, then in Matthew chapter 7, he says this, uh, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Verse 8, For everyone that asks, receives. He that seeks, finds. Him that knocks, it shall be opened. Or what, or what man is there of you, whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. You see the comparison there? No matter how good you are, you're evil compared to God. Amen. Just how good he is to all of us. So if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you also to them, for this is the law and the commandments. In other words, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Be kind toward them as you would have them be unto you. So who's heard this? The multitude. Inside that multitude was a leper. The leper, if you understand leprosy, and, and by the way, a lot of times we look at leprosy and we'll teach it like, well, that's sin in your life. You've got sin in your life, starts with a spot, it takes out your nervous system, and this happens, you lose your, you your eyes, your ears, and it keeps on going. But the bottom line is, we don't know how this man got leprosy. When you study about it, it just came upon you. And there are times things just come upon you. You, you. Nobody's asking in this place to get a virus. Nobody. But there's a chance that it could come upon you. There's a chance that there could be cancer. There's a chance for diabetes. There's a chance. All kind of maladies that happen to the body. Amen. A baldness, right? I mean, anything. I'm just you're kidding there. I'm just kind of keeping you awake. Amen. But all kind of things. I looked over here, Brian. Not toward you. I was over here. Okay, but all kind of things happen in our lives. And we have no control over them. They just happen. So here's a man with leprosy. And probably his fingers are, are, are gone. His ears. His nose, his face is swollen. He perhaps could even be losing his eyesight. Uh, you know, leprosy is known as Hansen's disease. It's short for HD. Just want to say that to you before I get to it. But amen, it's actually known as HD among the medical field. It's Hansen's disease. It's a loss of nerve endings. And you know, the bottom line is, is it doesn't, it, uh, leprosy doesn't take away your fingers, it takes away your nerves. So when it takes away your nerves, it takes away the, the ability to feel. And you've lost your sensitivity. You no longer care about others. And I do see that in the house of God and among people. They're insensitive toward other things that are going on around them. So here I'm reading this and I hear this man as he, he's coming down out of the mountain. And listen to me. He was telling, Jesus was telling them not to be afraid to approach him with inquiries. You have not because you, he's talking to the crowd. You ain't got it because you ain't been asking. You ain't got it because you ain't been seeking. You ain't got it because you ain't been knocking. He's telling it to him. So he slides on down out of the mountain. How many know the best way to learn is to ask? Just ask. Don't be afraid to ask. Amen. You have not because you asked not. So Matthew chapter 8 verse 1. When he came down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him. First off, say, Lord, if you will, make me clean. 
So what happened was the leper pulled away from the multitude as they're heading down, and he approached Jesus personally. Now, first off, it was against the law of that day for you to approach anybody if you had a disease that could be contacted from another one. Do you see how they're treating us with the virus? I'm just going to throw it out, out there. If you've been around somebody, you've got to quarantine. Even if you have no symptoms, you've got to quarantine. You've got to be away from them. And it's, it's contrary. Just let me just say it. It's contrary to the Word of God. The Word of God says, anybody sick among you, let them come and lay, let the elders lay hands on them that they may be healed. Follow me? Okay, it's contrary. So here's Jesus around a leper, and the leper comes and begins to worship him with what they believed was a, a disease that was contactual that you could get hold of. it. Uh, and Jesus, as he came, you know, you will never draw near to Jesus until you pull away from what has kept you from him. Whatever's kept you from him, you got to pull away from that. So he's with the multitude here. The multitude's head down the mountain. But, Jesus, but the, the leper comes over to Jesus, and he just begins to worship. You know, there are reasons why people don't draw near to God. There are several reasons. First, guilt. Guilt is a reason. Amen. The guilt of your past. You look back at what you did, and you say, you know, I, you know how would God love me? How can he care about me? You don't know what I've done in life. So guilt, the condemnation. Do you know condemnation comes from Satan? Conviction is from God. When God puts his finger on something, you go, but you got me on that one, God. And you say, forgive me of that. I'm turning away from that. I'm going to do everything I can to, to not do that no more. And I'm going to press into you. But condemnation is that which, in other words, you've already been forgiven of it, but it keeps coming back up in your conscience. Do you remember I told you about voices last week? That there are voices that talk. Uh, it's okay to have voices as long as you don't answer them. But you get a voice up in your head, and it's telling you all the time, you know what you did. You know what you did. Well, hold on. I asked God to forgive me for that last Sunday. And now it's come back up again. Did God forgive me? Yep. Why? Because I asked and God forgave me. Amen. And I've turned from that, but I keep being condemned about it. Because that comes from Satan. And that causes us not to draw near. He is an accuser of the brethren. Night and day. The scripture says night and day. He's accusing us before God. Amen. But mercy took our place. Can I get an amen? Fear keeps us from moving toward God. Fear keeps us out of the house of God. Fear keeps us away from the people of God. Fear keeps us away from God. People have primal fear. You know a primal fear? There's fear, a healthy fear, of knowing that God could put my soul, body, and spirit in hell. I understand that. But a primal fear says, I, I don't understand it, therefore I'm afraid of it. Primal fear says there's Bigfoot. Primal fear says there's something out there in the darkness. Primal fear is always telling you something under the bed. Primal fear is what the people had when Moses was on the mountain. The mountain was shaking, and they said, hey, you talk to God for us. They were scared of God because they didn't know him. They didn't have a relationship with him. So primal fear keeps us from God. Shame. Amen. Look what I've done. Look who I've hurt. Shame keeps us from moving back. I have shame. You all have shame. Uh, a couple weeks ago, something happened in my house. Jill came to me, and she was bothered by a, a situation that me and her got into it about something. And, and she said, Pastor, I want to wash your feet. I said, you ain't washing my feet. You cleaned the house. That's good enough for me. <laughs> that's what I told her. I said, you cleaned my man cave. That's good enough for me. You washed my feet right there. Because I believe in, that is what foot washing is, is serving one another. And she said, no, I want to wash your feet. Well, the one thing I've always had is messed up feet. I've had surgeries on them. They're drawn up and they've messed up. And, and it took me, and the truth of the matter was, it was my pride. It was my pride. I didn't want my daughter to wash my feet in my house. And, and it, was, it was a shame because I, I didn't create these feet. These came from God, but they, they messed up. So I keep them covered a lot. And, and her with her tears took my feet into a basin of water and began to pour water over them. And she began to, and I'm sitting here going, <sighs> you know what God did? He was breaking me from the shame that I had and her. And I didn't cause this leprosy. I didn't cause this problem I had. But it was something that, that this young girl decided, I, I'm going to make sure that me and you are good, Dad. And, you know, I'm her stepdad, but I'm like her dad. And so it's, it's, it was that moment, and I thought, you know, and really, I wanted to kick her right off the bat. But then I realized this was about her and me. Amen. And shame, shame can keep us away from God. Inferiority. Inferiority. Feeling less than. Amen. Not feeling worthy keeps us away from God. So you can imagine this leper. I mean, who, you know who goes to God. The kings, the princes, the queens. But not a leper. 
not one covered with a sash, not, not one who's, who's ate up with guilt and condemnation, and one, did I cause this to happen to my body? I lost my family over leprosy because they would kick you out into a colony. You'd have to go to a leprosium, into a leper colony and live among them. But he was in the crowd. He was probably hiding himself, and he's listening to Jesus preaching. Amen. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. In, in Matthew chapter 6, and he talked about praying, and when you pray, and when you fast, and when you give, and he's listening, and he's going, I don't have much to give because of this leprosy, because of this sickness, because of this thing that's drawn my life up and changed me. And then he hears Jesus say, ask and you shall receive. And he gets his boldness up and he comes in and he begins to worship him. And he asks, the scripture tells us in the book of James, draw close to God. Draw close to him. He'll draw close to you. All he had to do was move toward Jesus and Jesus moved toward him. Hebrews 10, 22 says, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance and faith, having our hearts sprinkled from the evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us draw near. Draw near to him. This leper came and you know what he did right off the bat? He didn't say, hey, Hey, would you heal me? Uh-uh. He said, Jesus, Jesus, I, I heard you for three chapters. I love you. Amen. I've been hearing your words. I don't know how they worship. I really don't. I, but I see him with tears in his eyes, on his knees, putting his hands up toward him, giving him adulation. Amen. It's amazing how adulation, you give it before you ask. By the way, you know that works also with you. If somebody will, will come up to you and, and tell you, just uh, bless you and thank God for you and appreciate you, particularly if they have your own DNA. I'm telling you, they, they, they're your kids. And they go after you that way. Then it's so much easier for you to be a blessing to them. Amen. And as he began to worship, listen to my friend, your worship positions you for his will. Your worship positions, positions you for his will. He, he, he didn't know what was going to happen. He just went in to worship him. By the way, after he got there, you can worship your way into his will. I don't, I don't always know what I need, but I'm going to worship. But the one thing this man needed, he knew he wanted to be clean. And see, then he reached out, his worship positioned him for his petition. Matthew 8, 2, if you will, if you will, can you make me clean? And Jesus said, I will. I'm willing. Listen, he's not willing that any should perish. He not, uh, you say, well, this, I don't think he wants you to live sick. I don't think he wants you to live poor. I don't think he wants you to live down. I don't think he wants you to live depressed. If he, go back to what he said, asking you shall receive. He said, if, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much more? How much more? If you ask for a fish, am I going to give you a snake? I'm not going to do it. I love you way too much. Now, I've got about three-fourths more of a sermon left that I'll preach next time you see me. Because <laughs> I want to get into naming the leper. I want to talk to you about Gehazi. i got a whole big old storyline for you. But, but we're not ready for all that yet. He worshiped. He listened. Contextually, he heard on the mountainside. And on their way down, he began to worship. He said, make me clean. Amen. And immediately, everybody say immediately. Immediately, he was cured from his leprosy. Amen. Ask and it shall be given. Thanksgiving, when you worship, it prompts a spirit of humility in you. I was with a friend the other day, and, I, and he said, Pastor, I've been having some problems. I said, yeah, I, I see it. One of your problems is when you come to church, you don't worship. One of your problems is when you come to church, you don't worship. You walk in with your wife, and you stare at your phone. And you look around the building. But very seldom do I see you with your hands in the air. There's a, there's a pride in you, and you've got to break it. I'm telling you, there's nothing like worship that sets us in position to receive what God has for us. And many times we come into house and all we want to do is hear the three songs and, and get on with the preaching. I ain't, I ain't into that. I ain't never been into that. Amen. It opens our hearts up so that we can hear. Gratitude is medicine that heals. I've taught my kids and I will keep teaching them whether they catch or not. Keep being thankful for stuff. Because when you are grateful, it heals you. Amen. It's appreciation is exercise that strengthens you. Greed and ingratitude, they affect God. 
When people were greedy, God sent snakes. He'd open up the ground and swallow them. Amen. It affects God. Thanksgiving is the way we're blessed. Amen. Eyes closed. Humility. Years ago, Bishop Gary McIntosh taught me. Humility is the position of strength. Whenever you try to get arrogant, puff yourself. If that leper would have walked on down the hill with that multitude, he wouldn't have received anything from God. If he just went on down the hill. But instead, he took a moment and he listened to what Jesus said. And he turned around and he asked. He asked. This morning, I want you to ask for something. I just want you to ask for something. Ask him for something. I don't care if you've got to write it down on a piece of paper. I want you to ask him for something. What are you asking for? And can you verbalize it? God, I'm asking you for the salvation of my whole family. God, I give my life right now, this day, for the salvation of my family. You don't require it of me. You require that I live for you every day. But I would give anything that I got to make sure my family makes it to the eternity with me. That's what I want. So that's what I'm asking for. What are you asking for? God, heal my body. God, extend my days. God, give me purpose. God, help me financially as I'm sitting on the edge of bankruptcy. God, give me wisdom of what I need to do. Ask Him right now. It's, why don't we just ask? Why don't we just ask? God, heal my wife. Touch my husband. Why don't we just ask? Mm. Online, why don't you just ask? Ask Him. Okay, now, whatever it is you're thinking right now, I want you to say it out loud together. Nobody's going to hear it because we're all going to sound like a bunch of tongues in here when we do it. All right? So when I say three, everybody, you ask him something. One, two, three. Did you hear that, God? It was inaudible to me. I can not understand it. But you have ears that I don't have. You pick up understanding from millions of prayers at one time. You know where faith rises up in the hearts of your people. Now fill them with faith. Fill them with faith from hearing the Word of God. May we listen more to the Word of God now. Than we ever have. You've shaken the church. You've woke us up. There's something going on within the church, God. You're doing something. You're bringing things back to the house. You're shaking things away from the house that don't even need to be here. God, I'm praying for revival. I'm praying for restoration. I'm praying for recovery. I'm praying for the reason in our life. That for people to come back to you. Reconciliation, God. To see it happen. Let it happen within the house of God. In Jesus' name. Come on, give God one more praise in here. Hallelujah. Uh, go to that next slide if you would, Kim, because I'm going to give you all some homework. I want you to read this chapter, 2 Kings, just wherever 2 Kings is. I don't want to go back to 2 Kings chapter 5. I, not right now, but I want you to mark it in your Bible, and I want you to read it. And I want you to ask God, God, give me some ideas about this guy. This is a great guy. His name is Naaman. Believe it or not, he has a love for God. You'll pick that up when you see it in the Word of God. You'll also realize that he has a servant named Gehazi. You'll know that he has leprosy. You'll know that there was a little maid that was taken out of the scene. She was, uh, uh, what's the word? Kidnapped. Amen. And she knew that there was a prophet named Elisha that had a word, the words of God in his mouth that could heal Naaman. It is an amazing story. Here's a good title for it. Seven ducks in a muddy pond. Seven ducks. If God told you to do something hard to get your healing, you'd do it. Wouldn't you? You'd do it. You'd give him whatever amount of monies you got and things. But Naaman, Naaman full pride. When Elisha said, go duck in the muddy Jordan seven times. I ain't ducking in it. Put me in clean water. That's what he said. Put me in clean water. Just do what God says. Just ask. Just ask Him. Why don't we ask? In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. If you need to tie the offering,